Welcome, everyone. And before we get started, I just would like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the lands of the Gurungai peoples, the traditional custodians of this land. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognize and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I extend that res respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples here today. So welcome to our second uh, research idea session. Uh, today we're going to talk about hip fracture care. So the title is hip, hip fracture care, where are we at and future directions. And we have two um, presenters. Um, so we're going to have first a presentation by Dr. Mitchell uh, Sarkis and then Dr. Morag Taylor is going to present and we're going to have some questions uh, at the end of both presentations. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and I should probably have introduced myself. I think most people know me, but my name is Marina Pinheiro. Uh, I'm an NHMRC Early Career Fellow at the Institute for Musculoskeletal Session, for Musculoskeletal Health, and I'll be chairing the session uh, for you today. Okay, so I'll just stop sharing uh, my screen so we can get Mitchell to share his presentation and start. Thank you for the um invitation to, to present actually so i'm going to be talking about hip fracture care where we are and future directions um and so i'm also based here at uh, sydney uni so i spend uh, a few days in the school of health sciences and then uh, a day a week with uh, sydney health partners which is one of the advanced research translation centers um in new south wales and uh, just to acknowledge the funding um, from the NHMRC and a big acknowledgement to the uh, ANZ Hip Fracture Registry and Jamie and Jackie and I think a few other people have, have probably seen some of this data, so apologies for the, the repetition. And I'd just like to uh, recognise and pay respects to Elders, past, present and emerging for all the lands um, of Uni University of Sydney's campuses. Um, and you know, if anyone wants to put where they're from today in the chat, um, please feel free and more than welcome. So just a little bit of intro to the to the team that I work in. So this is the Sydney Health Partners um, team. We've put together an implementation science uh, group here at Sydney, and um, these are the the three um, initiatives that that we're, we're all working on together. So. Um, one area in building capacity and capability in implementation research, one in collaboration and partnerships, and then one on uh, uh, innovations in, in implementation research methods. So that's uh, that's sort of how I spend some of my time when I'm not thinking about hip fracture. But so I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. It's a bit of a background to the work. Uh, I'm going to present on the Australian New Zealand Hip Fracture Registry Acute Rehab Sprint Audit that we ran. Uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, a systematic review into other perioperative uh, interventions um, that may improve mobility and function after hip fracture, and then wrap it all up together at the end. So this is where we start is, I guess, this idea of gaps in healthcare service provision. And um, this 60, 30, 10 rule seems to be quite stubborn um, across different clinical areas and, and over time. Uh, there's, there's been sort of lots of studies showing that, you know, around about 60% of care is delivered in line with uh, evidence-based evidence guidelines. About 30% is um, unwarranted or, or uh, considered low-value care. And then another 10% of, um, uh, of care provision ends up in, in some form of harm. So we obviously want to get more of the 60% uh, and less of the, the 30% and, and, and 10%. And so with that in mind, uh, I've got a, a five-year program of work in uh, the hip fracture space, working um, uh, trying to improve perioperative care for hip fracture in line with evidence-based guidelines. And so this is focusing on a few different areas, but, um, but today we're really just going to be focusing on uh, this, this uh, early mobilisation piece um, after surgery. So there's a lot of evidence in support of uh, early mobilisation after hip fracture surgery. Uh, so way back in 2014, there was a, a clinical practice guideline. Um, the Council of uh, the, the Clinical Care Standards in, include um, a specific statement on uh, offering mobilisation day one after surgery and 
uh, at least once a day thereafter. And recently, uh, the Kathy and, and team updated the Cochrane review looking at mobility interventions after hip fracture, um, further progressing the evidence base um, uh, in this area. And so when we look at the hip fracture registry, it kind of looks like we're not doing too badly in terms of uh, providing the opportunity uh, to mobilise. So the blue lines are um, those who are offered the opportunity across uh, the years 2017 to 2021, and this is a comparison between Australia and New Zealand, and the yellow greeny bars are those who, who aren't offered. So it's kind of like 90% of patients or um, more recently over 90% of patients are offered the opportunity to mobilise in Australia. Um, and we, we seem to be doing a little bit better than New Zealand. So it kind of looks like we're doing very well. But when we look at the number of people who are actually walking, uh, so this question was added to the, the routine data collection in the registry in 2020, uh, we said that even though most people offer the opportunity to mobilise, uh, a little under half um, actually achieve first day walking. So, um, so there's definitely room for improvement in terms of getting people up on that first day. And before our work, the uh, UK National Hip Fracture Database ran a physiotherapy hip fracture sprint audit. So they added uh, a bunch of extra questions to their routine data collection focused specifically on, on physiotherapy. And this is what really gave us the idea to, to do the same thing here in Australia. So they found about 60% of patients got out of bed day one. Um, that didn't necessarily mean mobilisation. That included people who were like hoisted out of bed into a chair. Um, patients averaged around two hours of physio in the first week uh, after surgery and uh, a big chunk of people missed a day's therapy because no physio was available. And uh, there were reductions in uh, time to discharge from acute hospital care, uh, which were associated with additional day of physio, greater than two hours of physio in the first week and additional 30 minutes of physio across the first post-operative week. So we wanted to look at similar uh, questions here in Australia and see you know, what we were doing differently, what we were doing better, what we were doing worse. So we set up an um, acute rehab sprint audit, uh, which ran in June 2022. Uh, and this was ANZ Hip Fracture Registry Hospitals uh, that would voluntarily opt into the audit. So I think we got around just over 40% of the hospitals um, took part. Um, I think it was about 36 hospitals out of 80-something. Um, we used, obviously, the same population criteria as the registry, so older um, people were admitted uh, after fractured hip with minimal or low trauma injury. Uh, and we added five questions at the patient level and five questions at the facility level focused specifically on uh, acute rehab practices, so those um, rehabilitation activities taking place before people were discharged from the acute ward. And it was important to keep those questions, you know, minimal and, and, and fairly tight because um, we don't want to overburden the, uh, the data collectors. So I'm going to go through uh, some of what we found um, before moving on to some thoughts on, on uh, how we might be able to address some of these issues. So first question was who tries to get patients up day after surgery? And Probably not uh, a huge surprise here that, that physio was the um, was predominantly getting people uh, up day after surgery, uh, or physio in combination with nursing or other stuff, and um, uh, a small number of patients getting up uh, just with the nurse and without um, physiotherapy assistance. Interestingly, in New Zealand, it seems to be more common for um, for nurses to get people up day one uh, without the physio. It was. It was quite rare in Australia. Um, I think it was 1% or 2% of the patient cohort. Um, and then in terms of how soon after hip fracture surgery do people get up for the first time? So we have great data on all the hip fracture patients going back for a few years on whether they get up day one, but we were interested to find out, okay, well, if they don't get up day one, how long does it take for them to get up or do they never get up at all? If they don't manage to get up day one and so what we found is you know that there's there's a small percentage of people who who don't get up uh day one but then manage to get up day three um slightly larger group who get up 
um, beyond four days, so they they might have a, a longer acute admission, and um, sort of around fifteen to twenty percent uh, of patients don't mobilise it at any time during their acute uh, admission. Uh, in terms of how much paper patients were able to do on the first day, so again, if people uh, mobilise, we've got uh, data on that, but if, if people didn't meet the threshold for mobilisation, so that's standing, stepping and transferring out into a chair, did they achieve, you know, some kind of other activity that was below that threshold of mobilisation? So things like um, uh, sitting on the edge of the bed, standing next to the bed um, and marching on the spot slash stepping um, and we can see that you know out of the people who don't mobilize there's there's still a nice um, chunk that managed to um, stand and and sit on the edge of the bed and then this this one was really interesting it was the most interesting for me was the reasons why people weren't getting up day one because that sort of points towards um, where we might be able to target interventions to improve improve that and um, I sort of broken down a lot of the reasons into into these main categories um, so uh, hospitals that have um, criteria around uh, HB levels um, so if people um, are, are sort of below a certain level then they, they won't get them up um, uh, people with uh, low blood pressure or hemodynamic instability um, delirium agitation was was the most common reason for not getting people up. Um, inadequate pain control was was fairly prominent as well. And then there was a small number of patients who refused to get up, but you know you're looking at about five percent. So it's not a not a huge number there. And then all the other uh, reasons that I grouped into into that other category. And uh, the final question at the patient level was what, what what was the average number of physio reviews per day um, in the first week after surgery? Uh, and what we found was both across Australia and New Zealand, it was uh, just below um, one session per day. So we, we, we're just below meeting the, um, the, the recommendation there for um, one session of uh, physio um, each day after surgery. So a little bit of a, a summary there. So most most achieve mobilisation day one, but um, uh, oh, sorry, those who who do mobilise mostly achieve it on day one. Um, physios are the most often the people who try to get people up on day one. Uh, about a quarter of people don't achieve any activity on day one, uh, unfortunately. Um, but then a, a, a great a, a large chunk achieve um, activity that that is just sits below that mobilization definition threshold. Um, people, as I said, receive less than one physio session per day. Um, and then those last three dot points are actually facility level uh, questions that I'm not going to present today. But there, there were some um, criteria for uh, discharge to subacute rehab um, that prevents people from residential aged care. Um, facilities from uh, from from being transferred and, and having access to rehab, and I think Morag's going to have a little more to say on that later. So, with all that in mind, um, particularly with a lot of the reasons why people aren't getting up day one, what came to mind is that a lot of those barriers to getting up day one after hip fracture surgery are. Uh, potentially not necessarily directly amenable by a physio. So if, if people are, um, uh, uh, their pain is inadequately controlled, um, the physios generally don't administer pain medication. Um, uh, you know, if, if people are hemodynamically unstable, again, the, the physios might not have a huge degree of control over that. So it, it raised the question of are there other um, perioperative interventions for um, mobility and function after hip fracture surgery, which can uh, help make the, the physio's life easier um, day one after surgery and hopefully the patients as well. So apologies for the small um, uh, figures, but I've just pulled um, some of the, the meta-analyses we ran. Um, so we conducted a systematic review to have a look at whether there were um, other perioperative interventions apart from mobility um, that measured an effect on people's ability to mobilise day one and um, and their physical function. And we sort of broke it up into, we only really found studies on pain relief and on um, perioperative pathways and protocols. 
So we we ran meta-analyses on these. And, and what we found is the effect of on uh, early mobilisation of, of different um, analgesia regimens, uh, again, there weren't many studies, but uh, we also weren't really able to find an effect um, for nerve blocks and uh, epidurals, although the nerve blocks are sort of trending in the right direction. Uh, um, if you look at the uh, the diamond um, uh, for the for the top subgroup there, it's it's not quite significant, but it, it's certainly close. Uh, but in terms of the effect of analgesia on on physical function, um, what we found was that there again just wasn't a significant effect overall. But interestingly, the two RCTs that look specifically at, at TENS actually showed that TENS might, might be beneficial. So this was a bit of a surprise for me, um, but, you know, may, may sort of be indicating a, an intervention we could, we could throw into the mix to improve um, physical function and, and mobility after hip fracture surgery. And in terms of the effect of uh, pathways and protocols on early mobilisation, uh, what we found here was that um, that there is uh, a slight benefit, a, a, an effect um, to get people up. Uh, you're more likely to get people up day one if you've got uh, like an ERAS protocol or an orthogeriatric model of care or other kind of perioperative um, protocols and pathways in place. And in terms of the effect on uh, physical function, um, this one actually is is like just not significant, but I think it's so close. I'm almost willing to call it um, significant on um, on the effects on of of pathways like ERAS and, and also geriatric models um, on physical function. So that that one's uh, very close, and I think you know borderline. You could call that significant. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to wrap up with uh, posing the question, can we improve day one mobilisation by targeting uh, other perioperative interventions at reducing rates of delirium agitation, uh, improving um, pain control and, uh, and trying to improve hemodynamic stability um, that day one after surgery? And so that's, uh, that's a direction that I want to uh, go down in, in, in some future work. Uh, and again, just an acknowledgement uh, again to the Hip Fracture Registry and uh, NHMRC for um, funding this work and um, thanks everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Great presentation. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Morag Taylor uh, and at the end we're going to have some time for questions. So Morag, are you able to share your screen? Yep. Fantastic. Is that okay now? now? Um, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about care provision for patients with and without cognitive impairment in the Australian New Zealand Hip Fracture Registry. Uh, so again, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from and pay my respect to elders past, present, uh, past and present and elders of other communities who may be here today. Um, so hip fractures for people with dementia, we know that more than 60% of people with dementia fall each year and that um, two to, they, they have a two to three-fold increased risk of hip fracture and with their hip fractures comes poor outcomes, so morbidity and death. Um, and they're also less likely to receive rehab and from one of the um, ANZ HFR annual reports, there's significant variation in care across Australian hospitals. Um, so Mitch touched on this. So there's a hip fracture clinical care standard um, and these are the standards that have been set out and the Australian New Zealand Hip Fracture Registry collects data to benchmark against uh, the standards in the hope that um, they can improve care and outcomes for people who fracture their hip in Australia. Um, so I, for this project, I've used ANZ HFR data um, the ANZ HFR is a clinical quality registry. They collect data for people who are 50 years or older who've had a minimal trauma hip fracture. And the data I've got is from 2016 to 2020. And there's more hospitals joining the registry over time. So in 2016, there were 34 hospitals and in 2020, there were 86 hospitals. So in the data I have, I started off with um, just over 55,000 records. But then when I wanted to look at um, who had a 
pre-admission cognitive status documented. I was down to around 53,000. And then I wanted to look at the patients who had surgical repair of their hip fracture. So I was down to 51,000. And then I wanted to exclude the atypical and pathological and missing fracture type. So I, my sample in the end is 49,063 records. And of those, around 30,000 are cognitively healthy and 19,000 are cognitively impaired. So the aim was to compare care provision and outcomes in people with and without cognitive impairment undergoing surgery for a hip fracture. So just in terms of um, registry data, it is a clinical registry and generally uh, the people who are entering data are clinicians and most of them are not paid to, uh, don't have a specific paid position to enter the data. Um, there has been improvements in the registry over time in terms of data rules and those sorts of things to try and um, reduce the risk of data entry errors. Um, but it is it is as it is. We can't go back and sort of check the data once once we get it. Um, some variables have been added over time. So, for example, the clinical frailty scale has been added in 2021, first day walking added in 2020, and uh, clinical malnutrition in 2019. Some definitions are clarified over time, and there's also a delay in the data availability, and this is because they're linking to the National Death Index, um, to the AHW data, and um, there's yearly slices taken and sites need to be given time to get the data in as well as make any data corrections that are needed. Okay, so this is, I'm going to go through and present some characteristics of the cohort um, and then look at some of the uh, outcomes in the cohort. So in all of the graphs, the blue are the cognitively impaired group, the green are the cognitively healthy group. Um, so you can see here, not unexpectedly, the cognitively impaired group are significantly older um, and the mean age is about six years older than the cognitively healthy group, but no difference in sex with about 70% um, being female in both groups. And I should say most of these uh, differences between cognitively healthy and cognitively impaired are significant. Some of them are clinically meaningful, some of them aren't uh, because of the large sample size, they still come out as strongly significant, even with very small differences between the groups. About 60% of the cognitively impaired group come from residential aged care, which is a big chunk, and you can see about 90% or just over 90% of people cognitively healthy come from private residences. And again, not unexpectedly, the cognitively impaired group have poor mobility with close to 60% walking with um, two aids or a frame pre-admission. And this is in contrast to a cognitively healthy group where most of them, uh, close to 60% walk unaided. They have a higher, the cognitively impaired group have higher ASA grades and you can see the uh, scaling system on the left there, but you can see that there's a high proportion with three, four, and there's a few with um, five. The type of surgery, so cognitively healthy group are more likely to get total hip replacements um, and the cognitively impaired group are more likely to get hemiarthroplasties. Um, and this is generally um, when they're deciding on what sort of operation to give, they look at the person's mobility and pre-morbid function to determine whether they get a hemi or a total hip replacement. And in line with that, the consultant is present slightly less in the cognitively impaired group uh, because I think Jackie's told me that total hip replacements, the consultant is supposed to be present. Um, in terms of pre-op cognitive assessment, um, not too dissimilar. Maybe the cognitive impaired group are, are having slightly more pre-op cognitive assessments, but the take-home message here is there's still a large chunk of people who are not actually being assessed preoperatively. In terms of pain assessment and management, um, so you can see that there's a slightly lower proportion of the cognitively impaired group who have their pain assessed in less than 30 minutes and a slightly higher proportion who don't have their pain assessment documented. Um, whether that happened or not, we don't know. And in terms of pain management, again, um, there's slightly more people with cognitive impairment who have a delay in their pain uh, receiving analgesia, and they're less likely to receive analgesia by a paramedic. 
In terms of um, orthogeriatric management during their admission, so cognitively impaired people are slightly more likely to have um, a geriatrics assessment preoperatively, and they're also slightly more likely um, to have geriatric assessment in the acute, case of the acute phase of their care. Encouragingly, there's absolutely no difference between the two groups in time to surgery. So uh, the blue is they had their surgery within 48 hours and the red is they did not. So about 80% receiving surgery within 48 hours. Um, now this comes back to, Mitch has already um, stolen my thunder here a little bit in that, you know, there's, a, there's quite a good proportion of um, people who are offered mobility you can see there's only a 4% difference. Um, so 4% less of the cognitively impaired group are offered um, day one mobility. And then when we get to who are actually mobilised, this is where the stark difference occurs. So you can see two thirds of the cognitively impaired group do not achieve day one mobility. And this is in contrast to about 40% of the cognitively healthy group who do not achieve first day mobility. Um, so there's a big contrast in what happens in care for people with cognitive impairment when it comes to actually mobilising. Uh, encouragingly, the surgeons have learnt that it's better not to restrict cognitively impaired people's um, weight-bearing status. So there's fewer people with cognitive impairment who have restricted weight-bearing. Unfortunately, there's more people with cognitive impairment who have pressure injury. Um, this could be related back to the fact that they're not getting out of bed. Um, we could do a bit more work in looking at that. In terms of bone protection medication, so I've broken this into whether you came from private residence or whether you came from residential aged care because prescribing practices may be a little bit different. Um, so not too dissimilar here. Um, slightly more people with cognitive impairment on vitamin D and calcium. Um, similar amounts are prescribed bone protection medication um, before they arrive in hospital. And encouragingly, there's an increase in the proportion who receive um, prescribed bone protection uh, medication on discharge, but still only just over a quarter uh, prescribed bone protection medication on discharge. And that's from private residents. And then when we move to residential aged care, um, again, there's a good portion who are on some sort of medication, but still only a relatively small portion are on prescribed medication, um, but about 40, 45% are taking vitamin D and calcium. And then on discharge, again, we see an increase to close to a quarter um, in both groups, the cognitively impaired group slightly less than the cognitively healthy group, but just 3% in it. Um, so that is encouraging, but still probably uh, more work to be done overall. In terms of post-op delirium, not unsurprisingly, the cognitively impaired group, more than 40% uh, have post-operative delirium. Um, again, another take-home message from this is there's still quite a chunk who are not being um, assessed for post-op delirium. And this is um, malnutrition assessment. So if you remember at the start, I said this variable was only introduced in 2019. Um, so it's a much smaller sample size, um, but you can see that the cognitive impaired group are much more likely to be malnourished, nearly twice as likely to be malnourished um, than the um, cognitively healthy group. And again, a big portion not being assessed, but this is a new variable um, and generally reporting of the variables improve over time. So if we move on to um, discharge destination from the acute ward. So again, I've broken this into community and residential aged care because um, as Mitch pointed out, um, some hospitals have um, a blanket. No, no one from residential aged care can go to rehab. Um, so just over 20% of cognitively healthy people go directly home um, from the acute ward. And this is down to, you know, around 7% of cognitively impaired people. A higher proportion, if you look at the residential aged care um, facility here, um, a higher proportion, much higher proportion of um, cognitively impaired patients go directly to residential aged care facility from the acute ward. But encouragingly, there's a decent number 
who are getting rehabilitation. They're less likely to get private rehabilitation, but they are getting um, people who come to hospital from the community, a good portion of them are getting um, rehabilitation. And then if we move on and look at those from residential aged care facility, you can see over 70% um, of the cognitively impaired group, if they come from residential aged care, go directly back. And there's a stark difference in whether you're cognitively healthy from residential aged care or whether you're cognitively impaired from residential aged care as to whether you would be given the opportunity to go to rehabilitation. Now we're moving on to discharge destination from hospital. And this is for people who have come from the community. Um, so here I'm going to confuse things a little bit. So green is still cognitively healthy, but we've got this um, green, which is everyone overall. And then the dark green is the cognitively healthy people who got rehab. And the light green is the cognitively healthy people who did not get rehab. And then we're going to come down to the cognitively impaired group. So we've got overall um, the cognitively impaired group is this blue here. Whoops, sorry. The darker blue is the cognitively impaired group who got rehab and the lighter blue uh, is the cognitively impaired group who did not get rehab. So if we take a look at this, it, um, for the cognitively healthy group, it looks a bit unusual where if you don't get rehab, you're more likely to go home. Um, but that's probably, uh, there are some people who would go home from the acute ward and not need rehab at all. So it's probably artificially inflated there. But if we go down and look at the cognitively impaired group, if you get rehab, you actually have a higher chance of going home and a lower chance of ending up in residential aged care than if you do not get rehabilitation. So this is completely unadjusted, um, this analysis. So uh, we've got to remember the cognitive impaired group are older um, and more frail and so on. And then if you come from residential aged care, so the colours are the same here, um, again, if you are cognitively impaired and you get rehab, you've got a lower chance of uh, less likely to go back to residential aged care and a slightly higher chance of um, going to private residence. And it's similar uh, for the group who are cognitively healthy if you've come from residential aged care facility. So what I don't know here is if there's been any data entry errors because people are asked what their usual place of residence is. And so they have it's been nominated that their usual place of residence is residential aged care facility. Um, so just moving on to 30 day mortality. Um, so this is everyone. Um, so 3.3% um, of the healthy group have uh, die within 30 days, and this is in contrast to close to 12% of the cognitively impaired group. Um, if we move on to those from the community, so in the cognitively healthy group, it's about 2.7 die within 30 days, and it's about 7% um, of the cognitively impaired group. And in residential aged care, the numbers increase um, substantially, so about 10% of cognitively healthy from residential aged care die within 30 days, and this increases to 15% um, of cognitively impaired people. Now looking at 120-day um, outcomes. So what we can see here, so this is, we've only, I've only looked at hospitals that have followed people up um, in the year that the patient was admitted, if there's 70% follow-up data, so that there's hopefully not a um, bias of following up healthy people. Um, and so here we've got cognitively healthy from the community and cognitively impaired from the community and then cognitively healthy um, from residential aged care and cognitively impaired from residential aged care. So what you can see is that um, the cognitively impaired group are less likely to have preserved mobility at 120 days than the cognitively healthy group. But if you remember back to one of my beginning slides, I showed that the cognitively impaired group are much more likely to walk with a frame. Um, and so I have, I'm not going to present it today, but I did just do some analysis to look. And if I control for pre-admission mobility aid, pre-admission walking, um, age, and so on. Uh, if you're cognitively impaired, you've got about a 40 to 50% reduced odds um, of having preserved mobility at 120 days. Um, so this 
that they were just proportions of people. So I then wanted to look at if we controlled for some other factors. Was there still an association between cognitive impairment and um, poorer outcomes or poorer care provision or poor achievement, attainment of quality indicators. So this is looking about at whether patients achieve first day um, walking. Um, so remember, this data was only collected from, the data I have is only from 2020. Um, so it's a reduced sample size. Um, and while adjusting for age, sex, where the person came from with their RACF or um, other compared to private residents, their pre-admission walking, their ASA classification, their fracture type surgical fixation, what you can see is that if you have delirium, you are less likely to achieve uh, first day walking. And if you are cognitively impaired, re adjusting for delirium, you're also less likely to achieve um, first day walking. And interestingly, if you're not assessed for delirium, you're also less likely to achieve first day walking. What we're not sure about is whether that group is that they um, were not assessed because they were clearly delirious or whether they could potentially have had an undiagnosed um, delirium. And this stood whether we looked at the whole sample, whether we looked at community and whether we looked at residential aged care um, separately in separate models. 30-day um, mortality, um, so again, I've looked at the whole sample, whether people are from the community or whether they're from residential aged care. So if you're not offered day one mobility, you're more likely to die within 30 days. If you have delirium, you're more likely to die within 30 days. If you're not assessed for delirium, you're more likely to die within 30 days. And if you have cognitive impairment, you're more likely to die within 30 days. And again, this is consistent whether you're from the community or whether you're from residential aged care. Um, now, this is looking at factors associated with discharge home in patients from the community. And again, we're controlling for all the same sorts of things. If you're not offered um, first day mobilisation, you're less likely to go home. If you have delirium, you're less likely to go home. Uh, if you have cognitive impairment, you're less likely to go home. And if you receive rehab, you're more likely to go home. Now we're going to shift, and this time I'm looking at um, just the group with cognitive impairment to see what factors are associated with 30-day mortality in the group just with um, cognitive impairment. So not looking at um, cognitive impairment as a predictor, but looking for factors associated with 30-day mortality in this group. And again, not being offered day one mobility um, increases your chance of dying within 30 days and as does delirium and not being assessed uh, for delirium. And then we shift to look at, and I'm going to confuse you here because this time we're predicting whether you go to residential aged care, so I'm flipping it. It's not whether you're going home, it's whether you're going to residential aged care um, and adjusting for all the same things. And what we find is um, not being offered mobility just doesn't reach significance. You can see the 0.95 confidence interval there. Um, if you have delirium, you're more likely um, to go to residential aged care and if you receive rehab you're less likely to go to residential aged care and poorer 120 day mobility adjusting for all the same sorts of things if you're not offered first day mobility you're more likely to have poorer mobility at 120 days delirium doesn't reach out to the 120 days here in this sample um, and again, this is only in hospital, only in patients that came from a hospital that had 70% follow-up in that year. And we've excluded people who died with 100, within 120 days as well. And if you receive rehab, you're less likely to have poorer mobility um, at 120 days. So from this, what can we say? Well, it confirms poor outcomes for people with cognitive impairment. Um, they're more likely to die, more likely to be placed in residential aged care. Maybe there's a slight differential effect depending on um, your usual place of residence, but um, still showing that um, regardless of whether you're from the community or residential aged care, you have poor outcomes. Care provision. So we probably need to be better at bone protection medication for all patients. Um, potentially there's some unwarranted clinical variation um, so first day walking, pain assessment and management, nutrition, delirium and pressure injury, uh, prevention and access to rehabilitation. 
So future plans. Um, so we want to look at um, this, the, as I pointed out in the beginning, there's significant variation in Australia as to um, whether people with cognitive impairment get rehab or, or not. So we want to look at the hospitals that uh, refer a high proportion of people uh, to rehabilitation and see if they have improved outcomes. Um, and then we'd like to go ahead and do a hybrid type 1 effectiveness implementation trial um, in people with dementia after hip fracture to try and reduce hospital-acquired complications and increase uh, the number of people who are mobilised on, on day one. And it'll need to be a multifactorial intervention um, covering these are some of my suggested uh, things that we need to cover postoperatively. Uh, to try and improve care and outcomes for this group of patients. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mareg. That was really interesting overview of your work. So now I'd like to open the floor uh, for questions. So who does anyone have a question? Feel free to raise your hand or unmute the microphone and go ahead and ask. Mitch, can I ask you a question? I was about to ask you one, yeah. <laughs> um, your meta-analyses with the nerve block, do you know the timing of the nerve blocks? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember now. I think they were all pre-ops, pre-op nerve blocks. Um, but I'm, I'm about to respond to the reviewer comment, so I can, um, as I do that, I'll, I'll have another look. But from memory, I'm pretty sure they're all pre-op. Yeah. Mitchell, would you like to ask your question to Moreg now? <laughs> well, I, I, I've got a question, um, and there's probably people in the audience who might have answers to this as well, but I was curious about if you had any thoughts why the paramedics might be less likely to give pain relief to people with cognitive impairment because that was that was interesting. I think that um, there's a couple of things in it. So one is that it's harder to assess pain in cognitively impaired people, particularly people with more severe cognitive impairment. You need to use things like nonverbal communication to work out if someone's in pain and not rely on asking them a question and them saying, yes, I've got pain. Um, and... I would like to, I, I think there could be some more education there around providing pain relief, um, potentially regardless of the person says, yes, I've got pain, um, or using alternate methods to assess pain. Um, there are some other methods that you can use. The problem is the validity has not, reliability and validity has not always been established in um, people with dementia, but there's, I, I looked at it a little while ago, there's really a shift in, there's, you know, apps now that you can get that take pictures of the person's face and then analyses um, their facial characteristics to tell you whether they've got pain. Um, I just don't know that they've been validated in people with dementia yet. Thank you, Morag. Does anyone want to add on that? Kathy, you've got your hand up. Um, I, I did have a question, but can I just add something, a, a personal anecdote on paramedic care for hip fracture? Um, and some of you, I think, have heard this story that when my mother had a hip fracture, um, unfortunately, the diagnosis of that from the paramedic was very unfortunate. Um, in fact, they uh, palpated the middle of her thigh, um, like as in halfway down the leg and said, oh, I don't think it's broken. Um, whereas I think we can all see with um, our knowledge of anatomy that it's not really the best way to establish whether the person's actually got a hip fracture. Um, and then they proceeded to get her to walk um, and, yeah, then we're, we're saying, oh, we'll, we'll take you to the hospital because the next fracture could be serious and I, the next fall could result in fracture. And I'm thinking, I think this one's actually resulted in a fracture. And I know, you know, people are doing work in this space. So, yeah, I think there is room for further training there. Um, yeah. So now my, my question was actually for Mitch. Um, so and sorry if I missed this, um, but yeah, really nice presentations, actually, both of you. Um, but Mitch, with um, the people achieving mobilisation for all your figures, um, was that just for people who were walking prior to coming in to hospital? 
Good question. No, that that was just for the the full four hundred um, cohort mm -hmm. that we answered. No, so I haven't broken it down by, um, but probably in the papers we'll we'll get to that level of granularity because that's um, yeah, that's obviously pretty important because <laughs> I'm guessing those ones that I think it was like fifteen to twenty percent never go back to walking. Well, they may not have been walking when they when they came in. So, yeah. I excluded them from my numbers that I presented. Um. Perfect. Um, Jackie, would you like to go and ask your question? Uh, a comment first, Marina, and then, and then a question. Um, so, Maura, with your with your data, some of the findings are not hugely surprising. Of course, there are associations that don't apply causality. I, I am open about saying that not everything in life needs to be an RCT. Uh, but I think I think for the data that you have shown where we just don't know whether it's the patient or the care providers that's the the issue. I think the RCT is the only way to go. Um, and I think you've kind of shown a, a, like a package, a bundled a bundle of care. And I think whilst you know that's a much more complex intervention, I think clinically it makes a lot more sense. I, I, I do feel it is the right way to go rather than just focus on being on a physio intervention or a medical intervention or a pharmacy intervention because it just doesn't reflect reality. So, so I like what you're suggesting. It'll be challenging, but it'll be well worth it. Um, my, my question then to, to both Mitch and to Moreg, both as physios, in terms of the difficulty in mobilizing people who are cognitively impaired the day after surgery. Um, and I don't mean to offend, but is this related to the cognitive reserves of the patient or the skills of the therapist in terms of the cognitive reserve of the therapist? I thought about that and thought that would be really bad to say, so I didn't. Um, but but just uh, it is about clinical skills and and how skilled you are at interacting with people with dementia and how well trained you have been. How, how much of that do you think is an effect? I think it's a mix. Yeah, I think some is patient level, and you know, you the, the physio has ultimately got to make a call whether they think it's going to be safe. And if the person's not following any direction and they're going to be in pain. You know, there is a risk. They'll just not weight bear on that leg and down they go. So there is a there is a level of, um, you know, clinical reasoning that has to go on. But I also then think that some of it is the person's, I mean, in, in public hospitals, which is predominantly where surgery goes on, there's quite junior therapists rotating around with varying levels of supervision if the senior's on leave and, you know, who may not have done any aged care before in their life because, you know, aged care is not really thought to be a mainstream of physiotherapy training. Um, it's an elective uh, for some people and, and, you know, they might get a lecture or two on it. Um, so I think that it's a combination of both and we need to try and improve the education attitudes <laughs> and perceptions of physios yeah. to give them the skills to be able to work with people with dementia particularly. Um, Our systems are all, also fairly rigid and, you know, physios turn up at this particular time, go off for lunch, come back for after lunch or whatever. Um, and if the person, you know, there are many people where you can get much more out of them if a family member is present um, and our systems are just not set up to be flexible enough. And I would argue, I, I don't think on your bundle, you actually had something around the carers and family. Because I, I actually did. think you did. I, I, I did, think yeah. they're as big, yeah, they, they are such an com important component in terms of getting the best out of somebody, regardless of whether they are cognitively um, impaired yeah, or not. They're down the bottom here. Maybe I should move them up. We've got the top more egg, particularly if we're going to get funding for it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think they're critical to it. And our systems and processes here. of care are just so inflexible in terms of allowing <laughs> for that to happen. Yeah, I've put them down the bottom there. But they are, yes. 
And I think yeah, that's just, another, I think that's sorry, Mitch, I'll just finish this. That just I think that's another thing. I think junior therapists can sometimes be frightened, a bit frightened to work with families. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. you know, because they're just getting their grips with what they're doing and don't want to be judged or Mitchell would like to add to Murray. I think I think Morag's covered it pretty well, and I, I guess I need to reiterate. I think the that element of yeah, maybe the junior staff member, or you know, Kathy mentioned in the group chat, like if you've got a particularly busy uh, list of patients to see that day, it it can. I know I've seen people who have offered the opportunity to mobilise to people, but the uh, the level of effort going to um to making that happen was was probably not as good as it could have been um so there's definitely i think there's definitely room for improvement there there is actually a a trial that um david snowden down in melbourne ran where they looked at a different form of um clinical supervision for the physios uh and it showed um a, a, a fairly good improvement in the number of people who were mobilized day one after hip fracture surgery i think it was like 10 or 15 percent jump um uh and that that was a, around just just a clinical supervision tweak um which which achieved that so that was you know that that could be a direction to go down as well um from the, the health professional side Thank you, me too. So, Jasmine, would you like to go and ask a question? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, both of you, for great talks. I, I was wondering, uh, I don't know if you've got this level of detail, but um, does weekend, like if the surgery happens on a Friday, then obviously the staff must, might be reduced on the weekend, or again, this question of having more juniors on at the weekend does that influence particularly the the possibilities that yeah people don't get mobilized on day one i think jamie can answer this i think it's part of the facility level audit is when they have a weekend service for physiotherapy but it's not related directly to the patient it's only related to the facility so then mm -hmm. um I mean, we do have data theatre, but it would be you would then have to retrospectively work out the day. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's all, it's it's all at the facility level, isn't it? Um, the UK Sprint Audit is published and they did look at it on a day-by-day -day breakdown, like whether the patient got therapy on the weekend. I, I can't remember the... I feel like they have more weekend therapy than we have, but I don't know whether it, I'm just tarnished by my own hospitals and I think it has changed seeing as I haven't worked at a hospital for nine years. It is improving over time so our facility audit asks if people have a weekend um, physio service and it has been gradually increasing um, over time. I think possibly around getting closer to mid 80 percent, 85 percent in Australia, a little bit less still in New Zealand. And is that both days or just any day? Um, I think it, it doesn't specifically say Saturday or Sunday. It's just whether there is physio and is it routinely available over the weekend. And I think in the facility level audit of the sprint, we also asked a question around weekend physio. So we'll be able to look at um, that as a potential, one would assume, enabler of um, early mobility. Yeah, that, that question was around um, the specific criteria. So, you know, we, we've got that routine one on whether or not there's a weekend service, but then we've, we've now got this extra question for the sprint audit around, well, who, who gets seen? Is it a blanket for the hip fractures or is it only people who are getting discharged on Monday or is it... Um, day ones. Day ones, yeah. So we, we, we can look at that. Right. Uh, Kathy, you previously had your hand up. Do you still want to ask a question or? 
I was just going to say that um, I think a trial yeah, is a great idea, as as Jackie said, because, you know, getting rehab could be a marker that you're going to get a better outcome anyway. And so, yeah, we really need, do need to see if we can change these things. Um, and, yeah, so very happy to help and yeah, support yeah, that through the CRE in any way that we can. Fantastic. We still have a couple of minutes. So does anyone want to make any final comment or quick questions? I will just jump in again. Um, so Charlotte and I um, gave a talk in Melbourne on Friday at their Hospital Falls Forum, um, and we came across the um, 4M program that they're doing in Victoria. Um, it seems really helpful. They um, they talked about using it in emergency, so in terms of um, assessing older people and kind of, you know, dealing with all the complex aspects, um, but in a way that kind of makes it simpler for staff. And they talked about it de decreasing the cognitive load um, for staff, and that they were really keen to collaborate as well. Um, so, you know, whether it's worth looking at that and perhaps even uh, adapting some elements of that. I think it's also worth maybe some of us visiting uh, Maria Fiataroni Singh's um, group. So you were in Melbourne, I was in Brisbane, um, listening to some of the stuff Maria does. And, you know, whilst initially you think, you know, these, these are frail older people going into a gym using equipment that younger people also use, it, you know, you're shocked to start with. But the reality is she does seem to get very good, outcomes um and her is it hip fit trial um d does have fairly impressive outcomes in terms of mortality reduction um so i i've come away feeling i need to be a bit more open minded um about that approach and learn a little bit more so Morag and i are going to go and visit at some stage if anybody else wants to come along let me know um and i'll i'm sure maria will be happy to um, accommodate us but but I, I think we just need to have a little look and see what we could adapt we get a window of opportunity for these patients in the post-operative period and if we don't deliver best care then the outcomes are poor in terms of ending up in residential age care and that's a fate worse than death for most of these people there's maria base jackie up here well balmain so she runs a strong program it's been running for a long time mitch uh, her husband Narlan Singh used to to run it, um, but it's still going there. But I, you know, I transferred somebody across who was a hip fracture from the RPA area. Transferred somebody across there. They were very keen to have her back. They knew her already, um, and they were planning to bring her back down to the strong program from the ward. So they run a slow stream rehab ward at Balmain, but patients are going down to the to the strong program in the gym there on a regular basis, you know, and, and we offer nothing like that um, at Prince of Wales. And I don't think many other hospitals offer much like that either, which which is also why I'm keen to start looking at whether these hospitals that do have that much more aggressive approach and are offering more people rehab, whether they really are delivering better mm -hmm. outcomes. And we don't know the answer to that yet. We're close to time. I'm also happy to to learn more about that. I mean, my my concern is that it is sort of sometimes marketed as like everyone needs to be in the gym doing strength training. So to me, I'd prefer a, a model that was more kind of tailored and had other options for people that that's not really going to work for. Yeah, yeah. No. But I, I agree, it can be part of the solution. It sounds good. So I think we are getting close, just two minutes over time. So I just would like to thank you everyone for joining today, particularly Mitch and Moreg for the wonderful presentations. Uh, and I'm sure the conversations will continue and some visits might happen after this, uh, this meeting today. So thank you everyone and have a nice afternoon.